everybody. So, so our so our next speaker is Maria Montanucci uh, from the uh, from the Technical University of Denmark, and she will speak on the automorphism group of care of uh, algebraic curves and positive characteristics. Thank you very much, Bjorn. And I would like to start by saying thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity of giving this talk today. And um, well, as you can see, I'm going to talk about automorphism groups of algebraic curves in positive characteristic. And uh, in particular, I would like to talk about some joint works with Gabor Kochmarosh, Pietro Speziali, and Juan Nizini. And um, this is an outline on how I decided to organize my presentation today. And I would like to start by fixing some notation and terminology that will allow me to describe the most important results according to the purposes of this talk regarding automorphism groups of algebraic curves in characteristic P. And this will create the necessary background to contextualize the three main open problems I would like to talk about today. And the first open problem is a very general question. I mean, suppose that you are studying a curve defined over field of positive characteristic P, and you fix the an arbitrary prime, which is not equal to P. And then here the question is, how large can be a group of automorphisms of your curve, for example, with respect to the genus? As a matter of fact, the underlying problem I would like to analyze in here for a topic is how is the homomorphism of a curve, which is invariant under isomorphism, related with respect to other two important variational invariants of the curve, so the genus and the period. And as a matter of fact, open problem two analyzes the case of curves for which the period is the largest possible, so period equal to the genus, ordinary curves. And if it will make sense, and I will explain why, that the homomorphism group of ordinary curves cannot be too large with respect to the genus. Here, the open problem is how large can it really be? Are we able to find sharp bounds for uh, the order of automorphism groups of ordinary curves? And on the other end, open problem three is uh, dealing with the opposite situation. We'll, we will see that a curve having a lot of automorphisms with respect to the genus are most likely to have p rank zero. And in here, the problem is how large should it be the automorphism group with respect to the genus really to be sure that the p rank is equal to zero? Are we able to find an optimal function with respect to the genus such that whenever we have that many automorphisms, we are sure that the p rank is equal to zero? But before talking about these uh, three open problems, let me fix some notation that I'll use during my talk. And uh, with K, I'm going to denote an algebraically closed field of characteristic P positive. With X, I'm denoting a projective, geometrically reducible, non singular algebraic curve defined over K. So we have this special set of points living in some projective space, let's say R dimensional over K. And um, I would like to emphasize that the non-singularity condition of the curve for the purposes of this law is not restricted because we are dealing with automorphism groups. So let's say transformations of the projective space in which my curve is living acting faithfully on the points of the curve. And this is known to be invariant under isomorphism. And every curve is known to have a non-singular model somewhere up to increase the projective dimension. So this means that after look at that model, we can assume non-singularity. But this property here is extremely important for us because it allows us to jump from the purely geometrical language of an algebraic curve to the purely algebraic one, given by the corresponding algebraic function P, K of X. And the reason is that there is, for example, a bijective correspondence within points of our curve and places of the function P of the curve. And this is nice because it means that we can choose the geometric language of the algebraic language according to our convenience. And I'm going to do that during my talk. And well, I mentioned that the homomorphism group out x is a variational invariance, but other two important variational invariants of the curve are known. The genus of the curve, or negative integer, and the p rank, or a Hasselwitz invariant, which is again non negative, and it is at most equal to the genus. And ordinary curves are exactly those for which the p rank is the largest possible, equal to the genus. So here the main question is how are those three invariants of the curve related to each other? Are they influencing each other in some ways? And this is a reasonable question because if you think, for example, at the case in which we have curves of the smallest possible genus, either elliptic or rational, then it is well known that the homomorphism group is infinite. So you can already see a relation between the genus and the homomorphism group in here. But the question is to which extent these three objects are influencing each other. And before talking about that, I would like to give an answer to a reasonable question, which is why 
automorphism groups of algebraic curves in characteristic P. And one can give several answers talking about coding theory or cryptography, but from the purely theoretical point of view, not only the automorphism groups being invariant are tools to characterize curves of isomorphism, but they are also a tool to construct other curves of which we know some properties regarding the variational invariants. In fact, uh, it is well known that if you fix a finite automorphism group P of your curve, then you can construct another curve called the quotient curve of X by G, and the notice with this symbol in here or Y, of which we know some properties regarding automorphism group genus and P. And the most formal way to define a quotient curve is actually uh, given by looking at the corresponding function fields and realizing one has a Galois extension and G is the Galois group. But informally, geometrically, the quotient curve uh, Y given by G is defined in this way. So you fix your finite automorphism group G. And this group has, by definition, a faithful action on the point of your curve. In this action, there will be some orbits. Well, the curve Y is nothing else but the curve whose points are exactly those orbits in here. So you're thinking about orbits like points. And this is not really formal, but it allows me to explain how to induce automorphisms on a quotient curve, starting from the automorphisms of your curve X. Because if you think about it, if you think an automorphism from the normalizer of the group D, then since you're normalizing the group G, of course you will have an action on the orbits of G, so an action on the points of Y, but not necessarily this action will be faithful. So if one considers the quotient group with respect to G, one makes this action to be faithful, and so one has an automorphism on the, quotient, on the curve Y by definition. The curve Y, in principle, can have more automorphisms in an unpredictable way, but it is a way to induce some automorphisms on the quotient curve. And the riemann lubitz formula and the doyen schiaparelich formula, respectively, give a relation between the genus and the peering of the curve X and the genus and the peering of the quotient curve down to Y. And uh, this depends essentially on the order of the group G, as you can see here, plus some information regarding the action on the group on the curve. For example, the number of short orbits, orbits in which the stabilizer of a point is non trivial, plus some ramification if it occurs in the ramification bounds. And I would like to point out actually that the donish barbich formula holds true only if it is a good group. And this has been used as a tool several times, as Gabor Kochmarosh mentioned already, for example, to construct maximal curves. Because uh, it is well known that if we have a maximal curve with many automorphisms, every quotient curve defined over FQ square, if the curve is FQ square maximal, will be maximal as well. So this is a tool also to construct, for example, maximal curves. But let's go back to our um, initial question. So how are automorphism group genus and peron related? Well, the first question at this point can be how many automorphisms can a curve have with respect to the genus? Well, we saw already that if the genus is at most equal to one, then the automorphism group is infinite. But if the genus is at most equal to, at least equal to two, it is well known and proven independently by several authors that the automorphism group is finite of your curve. And this is a nice property because it means that you have an additional tool in this hypothesis to use, which is finite group theory. And another interesting fact is that in uh, regarding automorphism groups of curves in characteristic P positive, exceptional and strange behaviors can occur that cannot occur in characteristic P. Wrong. And the well-known example is actually the classical group is bound, proven in 1892. According to this bound, one has that if you're studying a curve of genus at least two, defined over a field of characteristic zero, then its automorphism group has order at most 84 times genus one. So linear with respect to the genus. And this bound is well known to be sharp, meaning that there are several examples of all these curves. A famous one is the plane cortic, which is this plane curve in here of genus three and with, with PSL27 as an automorphism group, which has order exactly 84 times three minus one. So this bound here is sharp. In characteristic P, the classical response is known to be true whenever we are considering an automorphism group of order prime to P. But if your automorphism group has order not prime to P, so you have a non trivial zero P sub group, then this bounding here is far uh, away from being true. And the reason can be given, an example can be given, for example, uh, analyzing the remission curve. That's the number of can I interrupt for a second? I, I see that some people in the chat, some people are hearing an echo, but I, I don't hear it. But I, 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 I don't know if, if there's something, if anybody has an idea what could be 
causing the echo? Well, for, me, it's, uh, for me, it sounds as uh, if your microphone uh, has some uh, something uh, because it's it's not an echo like uh, when you have uh, a microphone that is speaking on your uh, loudspeakers, but it's more like the sound on your end is echoing. Okay. Um, let me try to see if I can do something for that. Uh, is, okay. is there anything different or uh, it is exactly the same? It's, I think for most people it sounds fine. So I think I, I th maybe don't, don't worry about it. I think just- Yes, continue. maybe just uh, the combination of uh, your microphone and uh, my headphones. Okay, okay. All right. Um, all right, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so, as I was saying, the classical response, if we have a non-trivial silo-pisa uh, group of automorphism, then uh, can easily be false. And a very famous example is given by the mission curve. The mission curve, mentioned already by uh, Gabor Kochmaros this morning, um, has PGU3Q as an automorphism group. And if one computes the genus of this curve, which is non singular, so uh, we have a formula to do that, one can see that this group has order larger than 16 times t to the fourth. So as you can see, we have more than geos to the fourth, many automorphisms. So the linear or its one cannot be true. And this curve is very interesting because actually it's this of proof that this is the only curve of genus at least equal to two, having at least 16 times g to the fourth automorphisms. So this is exceptional uh, for the size of its automorphism group. And I would like to point out actually that this curve being maximal has P rank equal to zero. So this also gives an intuition of the fact that if we have a curve with many automorphisms, then it is most likely that the P rank is equal to zero. As a matter of fact, if we have at least genus to the fourth many, then the P rank is equal to zero. This result by Stichnot was improved by Hen in his PhD thesis in 1976, considering the case in which a curve of genus G at least two has at least eight times G to the cube many automorphisms. And in this case, he was able to prove not only that the curve has P and Q equal to zero again, but actually the curve is completely known because it is isomorphic to one of the following four exceptional curves in here. And um, this means so that in characteristic P, if you have a non-trivial zero P subgroup, the automorphism group can be extremely large with respect to the genus. We know everything that happens if the, we have at least genus to the fourth many automorphisms. We know everything that happens if we have genus to the cubic power, many automorphisms. We know the curve and we know that the P rank is equal to zero. The first mathematician that studied intensively the relation between automorphism group and P rank, uh, for which we have an intuition now, uh, of a relation was the Nakajima in 1987. Nakajima indeed proved that if you have an ordinary curve, so it is equal to P rank, then the homomorphism group of your curve cannot be too large. It is at most of order 84 times g square minus g. And he actually showed that the value of the P rank influences the size of a P group of automorphisms of your curve, which is kind of reasonable if you think that we know that if we have a P group, our group can be extremely large. And actually, if it is, then the P rank is equal to zero. And this showed that indeed the size of your P group S is at most linear in the P rank if the P rank is at least equal to two, linear in the genus if the P rank is equal to one, or it can even be quadratic with respect to the genus if the P rank is equal to zero. Again, consistent with the fact that P rank equal to zero is necessary to have a lot of automorphisms. And he also showed that indeed, if you have at least this many uh, elements in a P silo, then the P rank is equal to zero. And this theorem gives us the possibility to um, discuss about some open problems related to this relationship between automorphism, genus, and P rank. The first thing uh, one can wonder is whether a Nakajima result like two can be found if we consider D groups of automorphisms where P is another prime, so not equal to P. Are we able to find bounds with respect to the genus or the P rank in this case for our D group? Secondly, Nakajima showing this result in one never uh, exhibited external examples. So one can wonder, is it possible to improve this bound to obtain a sharper bound maybe under um, additional conditions? And 
The third open problem is that we know from hence results that if you have at least cubic many automorphisms with respect to the genus, the parent is equal to zero. But is this the best function with respect to the genus that we can find? Is it possible to find that if our curve has quadratic many automorphisms, then the p rank is still equal to zero? And we cannot hope for the linear bound with respect to the genus because there are curves with linear many automorphisms that do not have p rank equal to zero. And these are the three open problems I would like to discuss in the following minutes. And um, before doing that, I would like just to give you an intuition on how I decided to analyze this open problem three. So find this quadratic, if it exists, function with respect to the genus. And the idea is that according to the riemann urwitz formula, you have this relation involving the genus of the curve, the genus of the quotient curve, the order of your group, and then uh, some uh, numbers taking into account the action of your group, which means that if you know that you have an automorphism group, which is particularly large with respect to the genus, the same formula should give you information regarding the action of your group. And as a matter of fact, it is known exactly in this way that if the classical bit fund is not satisfied for your group, then your group can act only in four possible ways on your curve, meaning that your group can have at most three short orbits, so orbits in which the stabilizer of a point is not trivial, and they are in these four possible configurations. Either these two short orbits are both non tame which means that uh, the stabilizer of a point has a P0, which is not trivial, or it has three short orbits, exactly one non tame or it has a unique short orbit, which is non tame or it has two short orbits, exactly one of those is non tame And when I studied the hence results, I realized that quadratic bounds, in the case in which the classical of this one is not satisfied, but either one or two are satisfied, is known. And then I also realized that in all the four exceptions given by Hen, the homomorphism group acts according to case four which means that in three, we have a cubic bound with respect to the genus. So my idea was, are we able to find maybe a quadratic bound also in case three? Because if we can do that, if we can find a quadratic bound, it means that if you have quadratic many automorphisms, then we know exactly the action of our group. And this is consistent with all those examples at the zero. So this can be a tool to prove actually that if we have quadratic many automorphisms, then we have Pirank equal to zero. But before talking about that, let me uh, talk about open problem one. So how large can be a D group of automorphisms of our curve if D is not equal to P? This problem makes sense, um, not only because of Nakajima's result, but also because the answer is completely known in characteristic zero. And the reason is that Zomorodian, in a sequence of paper from 1985, showed that if you're working in characteristic zero and your group G here is a D group, where D is a prime, then its order is at most nine times G minus one. And this bound can be attained, of course, only if G, G minus one is a power of three, because you have a D group on the left where D is a prime, and here we have a nine, so D must be equal to three, and G minus one must be a power of three. So uh, what my former PhD supervisor, Gabor Kochmaros, proposed me uh, during my PhD was, are we able to prove the Morodian result also in characteristic P whenever D is not equal to P? And are we able also to show that the Morodian bound is sharp because we are able to exhibit XML examples for all possible values of the genus? And I will say that the difficulty in analyzing this problem is not really to prove the bound nine times G minus one in characteristic P because we can use the riemann orbit formula to do that. But what was interesting to, to study doing so, it, to, to, to ask us, ourselves about is why the case D equal to three is so interesting with respect to the other cases. And what we realized soon is that if D is at least equal to five, then a sharper bound can be found for the order of your group, which looks like in this slide in here. And this fact is particularly interesting because uh, as you probably know, an abelian automorphism group of a curve of genus G has order at most four G. And this number in here is larger than 4G, which means that the next XML curve with respect to this bound is forced to have the group G, which is not a billion. But this number on the other end is smaller than 4G, which means that maybe the reason why this case is less interesting is that it can be realized for all D as a sharp bound using an abelian group. And this is true, because one can consider, for example, the Fermat curve of the degree D, which is a well-known curve which is not singular, so we can compute the genus. And actually, if you substitute it in here, and D is at least equal to five, what you will get is exactly D square. 
And then a billion group of order d square what well, morphisms from d square can be found because we can just map x and y into lambda x, mu y, where lambda and mu are primitive zeros of unity. So as you can see with the Fermat curve, we have an external example with respect to our bound for all possible d given by this abelian group here. So the question is, what happens then if we assume that the group is not abelian this time? And well, what we managed to show is that is the following. So suppose that you are fixing your d group g, and um, then of course, since it is a finite d group, it will have a trivial center. And you also can find at least a subgroup, say, z of order b contained in the center. And you can compute the quotient curve. Well, it turns out that if this quotient curve has genus at most equal to one, then it is of genus one. So it is elliptic. And the order of your group is bounded by this quantity in here, unless your curve is external with respect to Zomorodian bounds, and b is equal to three. Why is this theorem interesting for us? Because, I mean, suppose again that you are starting with your d group g, which is external with respect to our bound. And suppose that you are fixing all these sub z of order d and you are computing the quotient curves. Then, of course, the genus of this quotient curve will either be at least two or at most one. If the genus is at least two, you can imagine that this quotient curve will have a lot of automorphisms because z is contained in the center and it is a very small order. It is of order d. So g or z will be an automorphism group for the quotient curve. And as a matter of fact, we showed that this question curve will have so many automorphisms with g over z that it will be external again if the first one was. So this means that every time this elliptic quotient doesn't exist, we find another external curve, but with lower genus. So this curve is easier to study. And you can imagine that we can study that curve instead of the first one. So this gives kind of an inductive approach to study the problem, reducing progressively the genus every time this elliptic portion cannot be found. So the interesting case at this point looks like the case of the inductive idea, the case in which the elliptic portion exists. And if it is the case, then you have this bound in here, which is smaller than the one that I showed you before, which means that cannot be external if d is at least equal to five. So the interesting case is really the case in which d is three and the order of the group is nine times minus one. For this reason, from now on, I'm going to follow up to focus on what I uh, call external free zomorodian curves, which means curves uh, of genus G, such that G minus one is a power of three, and that meeting this three group of order nine times G minus one. And I want to focus on the elliptic case, which means the case in which this elliptic quotient can be found. And why, why is that useful in principle? Well, also because G modulo Z, if the elliptic quotient exists, is an automorphism group of an elliptic curve. And we know a lot about automorphism groups of elliptic curves. So I can use these properties and lift them to the original group G to reduce properties on the group G. And doing so, we managed to show that if you have an elliptic type external principal protein curve, then your group G as a very small center at most of order nine can be generated by two elements. And the maximum subgroups are exactly those of index three. And uh, exactly one of them, the lifting from the elliptic curve is either labidian or minimal non labidian And this last property was extremely interesting because three groups with this precise last property are completely listed and classified in terms of generators and relations. So collecting all these properties that we have in this proposition, we were able to show that if you have an external prism or linker, then you know exactly your group because it is given precisely in terms of generators and relations in this slide. So, this means essentially that we have a bound, nine times g minus one. And if we have an external prism or an curve, we know the group. So now it's particularly interesting to understand whether external prism or an curves can be found for every possible value of the genus. And what I'd like to, to show to conclude this part of my talk is that there is a method to construct external prism or an curves of a liquid type for every possible genus. And the method works as follows. So, if you want to construct the external prism of the curve, you want to find the curve of genus G such that G minus one is a power of three. So G is three to the H plus one. And you want a group of order nine times G minus one. So three to the H plus two. And you want it to be of a liquid type. So you want an element of order three in the center such that if you take the quotient curve with respect to it, then you have an elliptic curve. And this elliptic curve will have the quotient group as an automorphism group of order three to the H plus one. Well, this is equivalent if we turn the picture from the opposite side to start from an elliptic curve that we know, for example, this Fermat type elliptic curve in here, to fix there an automorphism group 
g bar of order 3 to h plus 1, and try to construct a smart Kummer extension of it of order 3, such that these automorphisms live in exactly three ways. Because in this way, we can find the group of the right order. And if the ramification is the right one, then we can also force the genus to be the one that we want. This is more or less the strategy. And to do that, so let's fix our elliptic curve in term R equation. And let's consider with J the corresponding Jacobian group, which is we are working over the algebra closure. So this is infinite, abelian, and semi regular on point. Let's fix the point minus one, zero, one, which is a point of this cubic, of course, and it is an inflection point. And let's fix alpha bar to be this automorphism here of order three, which of course fixes P because the y coordinate of P is zero. So of course it is fixing P. Well, now we have to fix our group G bar and we want to figure out how to lift it. Well, what we showed as a preliminary result is that your group G bar can be chosen to be a semi-direct product of this type where H bar is its intersection with the Jacobian group of index three and that bar is this automorphism here fixing a point on the elliptic curve. And actually this group can be generated by two elements. So doing so, uh, being so, let's fix our group G bar to be exactly in that form. And um, well, since the group can be generated by two elements, you know the order of the Fratini sub of your group G bar because it counts the cardinality of a minimal set of generators. And on the other hand, the Fratini sub is the intersection, by definition, the intersection of all the maximal subgroups of G bar. And the H bar is because it is of index three. So it is contained in H bar. And this is useful because H bar is contained in the Jacobian. So this means that this group in here is abelian and it is semi regular on point. So we know the action of it. And this allows us to create the, the following picture. So let's consider the point P at the time before and the orbit of G bar, say theta, containing P. We know the length of this orbit from the orbit stabilizer theorem because alpha bar is fixing P. So this orbit will have length exactly equal to the order of H bar. And since the Fratini subgroup is normal, actually this will be the disjoint union of three orbits of it, theta one, theta two, and theta three. And as a result, the group G bar will act on these three orbits, cyclically permuting them. Using a results by Korchmaro, Schnogi, and Pace on three nets, we were able to prove a nice regularity regarding the intersection with lines of this orbiting here. Namely, that if you consider a line joining P to a point Q from the second orbit theta two, then the third intersection point, which exists from the Zoo theorem, is a point from the third orbit. So whenever you join two points from two different orbits, the third one is contained in the third orbit. And that is useful because we are going to fix such a line, R, and we are going to compare it in the function field uh, together with the inflectional tangent at P, which will intersect the cubic exactly in P with multiplicity three. And as a matter of fact, if we consider the function T in the function field of the elliptic curve, even by the ratio of the two lines, then we can compute easily the divisor of this function because we know the zero divisors of these two lines. And if we now compute the function W given by the product of T, together with all the images of T with respect to the Fatini subgroup, also for this function, the divisor is easy to compute. Because I mean, theta one, theta two, and theta three are orbits of the Fratini subgroup. And we are taking all the elements of the Fratini subgroups in here. So in this divisor, what happens is that we are moving P in all possible ways around in the orbit theta one, Q in all possible ways in theta two, and the same from R. So we are replacing essentially in this divisor in here, the points of the subgroup with the sum of all points in the orbit of the Fratini subgroup containing the point. And that's nice because uh, I said already that G bar X on these three orbits in here. So X on this divisor. And we can use this fact to try to understand how the image of W with respect to an element small G bar in G bar um, looks like. Because G bar, of course, can either permute cyclically in these three orbits or fix them. And if this small g bar fixes them, then it fixes the divisor of W. So it means that it's mapping W into a constant times W. They have the same divisor. But if, on the other hand, this small g bar is permuting typically these orbits, then the divisor of g bar of W over W is three times the difference of two orbits, which make us think that maybe this is a cube in the function feed. And this is exactly what happens. So thanks to this particular structure in here, every element from G bar will map W into a cube times W. 
And this is nice because now my claim is that the excellent reasonable loading curve is given by the Kummer extension induced by W. And this is a Kummer extension because as you can see, the divisor of W has single simple zeros, and then we have poles on multiplicity two. So these points are all totally ramified, and this is where ramification occurs. So we can actually compute easily the genus of this curve, which is the right one. It is three to the H plus one. But actually, we can also use this curve to, to construct the group of order nine times G minus one, which means we can lift every element from G bar in exactly three ways. And the reason is that we can, fixing the small G bar from G bar, we can just define an action on Z, which maps Z to V times Z, where V is the cubic function that I defined before in here. And that's good enough because, of course, this G will fix the first equation of the curve because we didn't change the action on X and Y, and this is an automorphism of the elliptic curve. But on the other end, if you compute the image of the second equation, so the image of ZQ, this is by definition equal to G bar of W over W times W. So it is G bar of W. But W is a function of X and Y. So G bar of W is actually equal to G of W. So as you can see, also the second equation is preserved. So the genus is the right one, and we are lifting every automorphism G bar in exactly three ways, giving rise to group of the right order. So this is an intuitive idea behind the method to construct X matrizum loading curves, and now can actually use magma to obtain explicit equations for them that are arbitrarily ugly, I will say, but they are quite, uh, quite explicit. I would like to use the last uh, minutes of my talk to talk about open problem two and open problem three. In open problem two, we are dealing with automorphism groups of ordinary curves. So the case in which the genus and the pyramid are equal to our curve. And I mentioned already that Nakajima showed a quadratic bound in this case for the order of your automorphism group without external examples. So the question is, can this bound be improved in general? And what we managed to prove together with Gabor Kochmaros is that if you have an ordinary curve of genus at least two defined over a field of odd characteristic, and if you fix a solvable automorphism group of your curve, then its order is at most roughly genus to the three over two. And so this is an improvement of Nakajima result, but it, it has a strong hypothesis. I mean, that the group uh, is solvable. But what makes this bound to be interesting is that we know that it is sharp. Because with Korchmarsh and Speziali first, and then with Giovanni Dini, we constructed infinite families of external examples. So this is a sharp bound, actually, in the solvable case. Can I, I, can I ask uh, about this, this theorem? Uh, it looks like the, it looks, I mean, you have two bounds here. It looks like the, the middle one is a lot better than, the right yeah, one, yeah. Unless, unless, unless the genus is very small. Is that the point? I mean, yeah, no, uh, the, the real bound is the one in the middle. This is a. a oh, oh you're point. just giving a. a oh, you're, okay, that's just a, a simplification of, of the real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just oh, a, okay, I see. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to, 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 to show you the proof of this theorem, but I just would like to add a comment regarding how solvability of the group is uh, useful to prove a result of this type, so to try to improve Nakajima's bound. And the reason why solvability is a useful tool is that. You can imagine that we can try to prove this bound by contradiction, so that we assume that we have a curve X and the group G, such that this bounding here is not satisfied. And we can also assume that our curve is minimal, as we call it, as a counterexample, which means that this the counterexample with the smallest possible genus that we have, meaning that also, as a result, if we have another ordinary curve of smaller genus and an automorphism group H, which is solvable, then for this H, our bound should be true. And doing so, now remember that our group is solvable. So it has a minimal normal subgroup, S, which is elementary abelian. So this is a very nice and small normal subgroup in G. So it makes sense to consider the quotient curve with respect to it. And well, the quotient curve then will have a lot of automorphisms, the quotient group indeed with respect to this S. And proving that this curve is still ordinary, we managed to prove that actually also for the quotient group, this inequality in here is satisfied, meaning that we have a contradiction to the minimality. So the existence of this nice minimal normal subgroup in here allows you to obtain a contradiction immediately whenever the genus of the quotient curve is at least equal to two. So this means that the genus of this quotient curve is necessarily either one or zero, 
but automorphism groups of curves of genus one or zero are known. So you can use the properties of those groups to obtain a contradiction anyway. So the solubility is used because of this minimal normal subgroup property that can be used to obtain a contradiction looking at the quotient curve. And um, these are, in these slides, collect the external examples with respect to our bound. And um, for example, here we have what we call the generalized R.P. Mumford curves, which are given by plane curves in which you multiply two generalized polynomials. And uh, they are always ordinary, and they have roughly genus to the three over two, many automorphisms. And um, we call them generalized R.P. Mumford because in the R.P. Mumford curve, you have in here x to the p plus x, or x to the q plus x, and in here y to the q plus y. Here we have two arbitrarily generalized polynomials. And I would like to finish this part of my talk just mentioning that further improvements of uh, the theorem I showed you before uh, are also available, because together with Pietro Speziali, we managed to extend the result for solvable groups of ordinary curves also in characteristic two, obtaining exactly the same bound. We have a 35 instead of a 34, but it is asymptotically the same. And uh, we analyzed also the case in which the group is not solvable, but the curve has even genus, obtaining a bound of this type. It is still an open problem to understand whether Nakajima's bound can be improved in the case in which the genus is held to so a sharp round. So that first theorem is characteristic two. I, I guess that odd is, it says odd characteristic two, I just wanted to just- Yeah, question. yeah. Okay. We, we need to change all very, the tools. Okay, very, very unusual yeah. characteristic, yes, okay. And uh, finally, uh, the third open problem that I mentioned is how large an automorphism group should be with respect to the genus to ensure that the quotient curve has, the, the, the curve has P and Q equal to zero. And there the idea was, since we know the all four possible actions of our group, then an idea can be to prove a quadratic bound also in case three, so that we know exactly the action of our group if uh, it has quadratic many automorphisms. And, um, Proving a quadratic bound in this case is um, a quite recent result, recent result that I obtained. And uh, what I managed to prove is a quadratic bound, indeed, also in case three, with a very huge constant, three, three, six. But this shows that for now, um, whenever you have quadratic many automorphisms, then you know exactly the action of your group. And it is consistent with uh, hands examples. And um, I try to decrease the constant um, to 60 g squared. But then using the zeta function, I managed only to show that the P-rank, if it is positive, then it is congruent to zero modulo P. And it is still a work in progress to understand whether a quadratic function can be found also in case four uh, to ensure that P-rank is equal to zero. I would like to finish my thought just giving you an idea on how this case three uh, can be analyzed. And if you remember what that assumption are in here is that the group has a unique short orbit, which is non-tame. And if we call this orbit O, then it will contain a point P. And I uh, try to, to prove the bound by contradiction. And I distinguish the case in which the point, uh, the orbit consists only on the point P or if it has more than one point. In the case in which it has only one point P, then the group is fixing the point. So uh, in this case, it's not difficult to prove that actually there is a quadratic bound with respect to the genus. So we got immediately a contradiction in this case. But if there is more than one point, um, the idea was first to prove that the P-rank must be equal to zero. And the way in which I did that is assuming that the P-rank is larger than zero and then using from previous results that if the P-rank is larger than zero, then O has a very precise structure. It is the disjoint union of P and the only other short orbit of the stabilizable point, which means that the stabilizer of a point is transitive on O minus P. So the group is too transitive. And if the group is too transitive, then we have the least of finite to transitive groups and we can analyze them individually to obtain a contradiction. So this was to ensure that the curve has P-rank zero, but then I can use another tool to prove that also the case P and Q equal to zero cannot occur, which is the doring shafarovich formula. And the doring shafarovich formula gives immediately a contradiction if the P and Q is equal to zero. So this means that if this bound is satisfied, then first the curve is forced to have P and Q equal to zero. And then I show that also the case P and Q equal to zero cannot occur. So we have the contradiction in any case. And um, 
I would really like to finish my talk mentioning that it is not difficult to find examples of curves satisfying case four, the remaining case, having quadratic many automorphisms. And actually, Gabor Kruchmarosh mentioned some of them today. The GK curve is a well known example of a curve having quadratic many automorphisms, and in which case four is satisfied. The scheduling curves, extension of the Suzuki and recurves, also uh, have quadratic many automorphisms with respect to the genes, and case four is satisfied. But these curves, unfortunately, will not give a counterexample to the idea that our function f can be quadratic with respect to the genus, because they are both maximal. So the appearance is indeed equal to zero, as we want to show. And uh, this is everything I wanted to, to tell you today. So thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you for your talk. It's with, with so many interesting results and lots of further directions too to study. So are there other comments or questions? Okay, uh, Lisa. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was very nice. And I mean, actually my question was a little, so I mean, you explained somehow like fixing the genus, which ones are like the possibilities for the automorphism group. And my yep. question, goes in the other direction and somehow because we just had the other talk before. So if I give you a group, any group, are you able to construct a curve whose automorphism group is isomorphic to this group? Is that possible? Yeah, this is uh, known as a result that every finite group can be realized as an automorphism group of an algebraic curve. But the existence of that automorphism group will probably influence the genus. And so that's my question then. Yeah, that how so, can you relate the genus of the curve? Yeah, okay. but as a possibility, abstractly, it is known that every finite group can be constructed in that way. So as an automorphism group of some curve. Nice, thank you. Okay, are there other, other questions? Christoph? Yes. Uh... I think I, I saw a paper at some point where people were studying maybe an analog of um, uh, AG, I mean, uh, AQ, you know, I mean, when you take the limit sup of uh, the order of the automorphism group divided by the <laughs> power of G. And I was wondering, I mean, if you could a bit do, I mean, in the same philosophy as Monderer explained to try to stratify it now by the P rank and say, I mean, for a given P rank, what do you expect for this limb soup? I mean, this would maybe give like a, a sense of, I mean, cleaning a bit the picture because I mean, there are so many cases right now, but if you do this stratification, maybe it would help having a, a clearer picture. I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it is an interesting question. Uh, yeah, I, I never thought about this actually. I think it would be interesting to do that. I. I don't have uh, any idea of what the result would be right now, but I think it would be very interesting to analyze indeed. Thank you for that. I mean, if you have something that grows in G cubes, then it's necessarily uh, the, um, how is it called? The Hermitian curve or, or something like this. Or or genus it... to the fourth, yeah. Yeah, genus to mm -hmm. the fourth. Okay, so I mean, if you would like take any kind of curves, I mean, it would be a bit stupid then because the limit you could, uh, you take yeah. this one and then you would get it. But I mean, if you start like stratifying, then I guess you would not get this one anymore. I mean, yeah. and, and yeah. then I mean, it would be like a non-empty question somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, thanks again for your talk. Okay, are there more questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you again for, for your talk. And so I think in an hour and 15 minutes, we have the, the last talk of the day by, by Kristen Lotter. Yeah. Okay. Oh.